Me and my great friend Mike from the Talos of EV podcast had the absolute pleasure of getting to interview Aptera's chief of design, Jason Hill. And I'm very excited to show this interview for you guys today because it's the first of its kind for this type of channel. And just so you guys are clear, this is not like a paid interview or anything. They just carved out some time in the day for us and we were able to ask Jason about whatever we wanted and it was awesome. And I get the feeling this will not be our last opportunity to interview chiefs of staff of Aptera and hopefully other EV startups or EV companies in the future. He was recovering from a little bit of a sore throat so his voice is a little bit quieter but still a lot of fascinating discussions talking about the big picture of the company and what we're looking forward to as a whole. So without further ado, let's begin. Well thank you Jason for making the time to uh, be interviewed by us today. We really appreciate it. For sure. Thank you for having me. You were probably put as the chief of design in a really challenging position when, did they come to you saying, we want all these different range numbers of like, we want one model to be 250 miles and we want one model to be 1000 and some in between. How did they come to those numbers? Were you able to figure out in your own design scheme of like, here's what we can do, here's what we can't do? Sure. Um, excellent question. And, and, and thanks for that. There is a design element to that um, where you wouldn't you wouldn't think like, well, what's, what's the chief of design doing on the range? part but it goes back to the um, very direct mandate from Steve and Chris and when we kind of re rethought the Aptera formula for the future they were very clear about what the minimum energy would be usable to go a meaningful distance and that was kind of the 250 and then they were really targeting somewhere in the mid 500 mile range in order to kind of get out ahead of any at the time um, that would have been ahead of anybody else's stated range. Not exactly flippantly, but I said, well, fine. You guys tell me, what would it take to get to a thousand mile range? And they, especially Steve said, I don't know. And the next day he had an answer and it was very solid. So I said, well, that's what you lead with. You lead with a thousand mile range because everyone is half that or they're aiming for half that. But if you yeah. kind of set a high end and the, the point is not that you're gonna always use or want or, or need a thousand miles range. The point is that you can do it with the same energy that would take somebody else to go a quarter of that way. And if we use the quarter of energy that they're using, we can go four times further, right? So it works on both ends. So that's that was kind of the equation. Um, and then it was pretty clear from those bookmarks where, where the target was. Launch edition featuring 400 mile range is essentially a reflection of all of the interest and the most orders fall within that. So yes, people are ordering 250, 1,000, but the 400 really represents the most efficient way to capture the most uh, or the broadest market segment, let's say. I don't think we see that anywhere else in the industry, like one vehicle that needs to be able to accommodate for 25 kilowatt hours and also 100 kilowatt hours. And most of those range figures, I'm pretty sure all calculated based on 100 watt hours per mile. That's the big milestone. That's what no one else can hit. Is that an average based on all the different trims or is like the launch edition targeting 100? And I imagine with a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack, that one's gonna weigh a lot more. Can that one still hit 100 watt hours per mile? How do you maintain that. The packaging constraint is not so much limited. There is no real difference in the 250, uh, 400, 600. In other words, size and, and you know, there's a weight difference when you start getting a little bit bigger. The real challenge for us is to say, okay, how do we get that 100 kilowatt hour pack, the thousand mile range battery into the space? And we have that, we have that ability. It's not wasted space, but you look at it as like, we have a given envelope and we know how to pack the density throughout that envelope in the most efficient manner. Did you work a lot with the CFD results or at least the engineers who are doing a lot of the computational fluid dynamics in the design for the vehicle? Because I know the focus is on efficiency, especially aero efficiency, and that's how you get those amazing ranges. But was is there a lot of aspects in this vehicle that you probably put in there that didn't really affect aero that much, but felt that it was giving a little bit more of a modern look or kind of your own little signature to it? Great framing on the question. I appreciate that. I would say that there's there's a lot of aspects to that. And, and first and foremost is that the CFD calculations are, are leading us. They're pulling us forward. And then we iterate through variations, um, you know, such as the, the envelope for fitting the people inside. We could make this much more aerodynamic, but 
only half of us would be comfortable in it. So we have a bigger goal there. The working with the aerodynamic engineers, kind of filtering their suggestions, but also challenging them on certain either conventions or expectations, that's the fun part. And with CFD, you get a very quick result. We used to have to physically model both minor changes and larger changes and then run those. My experience, especially working for so long in, in automotive aerodynamics, it was always interesting because you would you would make the big changes on scale models, third, even half scale models, because you could you could iterate quickly. And then you would do the minor adjustments on the full scale models. Well now we have such an efficient way to iterate those changes, both on the, the, the minor side, you know, small details like the mirror shape versus you know large changes which is which we've made through the use of the AI. Like the AI generative part said, it's not pretty, but if you go in this direction, you might get a better result. So then we would do our traditional kind of 3D modeling, put it back through the CFD, and then you, you have a baseline to judge against. So it's been a fantastic process. It's, it's true design and engineering as opposed to hey, this looks good, let's see what it, how it performs. Right, it's a definitely a lot more efficient process now, being able to just quickly make a design change, whether it be small or large, and quickly just run it through the computer versus what it used to be, which was make a clay model or something like with Play-Doh or wood or anything else, put it through a wind tunnel that someone owns, or even, if you're lucky, kind of like what you guys had with working with NASA at Langley yeah. and being able to just throw it in there and see what's the coefficient of drag, where's our high pressure and low pressure zones and all that. Go through that whole entire testing process, which just costs much, so much money, even though like it might just be a one-off, it'll influence many different ideas. We might just be taking for granted these days, the tools that we have with computers in regards to stress analysis. They're leveraging the philosophy of aerodynamics and they're leveraging the math so we can get the results from the math much quicker. Not a lot of Play-Doh used, but you're not far off with wood and clay. <laughs> a lot of our models right. in the wind tunnel back that I'm experienced with were, they were a wood base with a way to attach it to the plate, and then there was mm -hmm. foam, and then you, their outer skin was, was this modeling clay. You'd make the changes, clean it up, run it, and then start to correlate all the information. But you're absolutely right that now the power of the CFD, it, within hours, make rapid changes and hundreds of thousands of, of calculations and iterations gives us just such a, a efficient way to optimize this vehicle. Especially when you're making a vehicle this aerodynamic, you're, you're kind of boxed into a lot of corners, especially when a lot of the industry is like, this is the big CCS connector, you gotta fit this on there somewhere. And I was like, I don't know if you've seen my videos, but I basically rant about how much sense you guys make compared to everyone else. You're the only ones with a brain to be like, hey, NAX makes sense. Like, let's just use the connector that most EVs here are using and the biggest charge network. And it fits perfectly behind the license plate and everything. And so it's out of the way, dual purpose. But even before Tesla said like, we're, we're opening up NAX, you guys were intending on using that and you were saying this is the plan is there any like direct contact with tesla or is it mostly just like we're hearing what they're claiming they're gonna do and we're hoping they stay true to their word about it um well it's both and you know some of us was us being a little bit you know forward thinking like this is where we want to be um yeah. you know kind of skating to where the puck will be and that's where we thought it was going because it makes the most sense it's not just the packaging size that makes the most sense it's, that's the one end there's the you know there's the engineering side but even from a user side, when you think about, let's call it hooking your vehicle up to something, not only where you hook up, but how easy it is to do that, that played into a lot of it. Having experience with the NACs or the, the connector, you push a button, you plug it in, and you're done. There's no five steps. Yeah, <laughs> thankfully. And so there's, there's an, an engineering side that you can convince yourself that a system is the best or more robust or whatever. But on the other side, you have the user that just says, I don't care about that. This is this is a much easier thing. We kind of went in that direction because of what you said. And I, yes, I've watched some of your videos. It makes the most sense. When you strip away all this, the signal to the noise and you just go, no, I'm not gonna listen to anything else. You go steadfast to what you believe in because it makes the most sense for this product. I'm glad there's that collaboration going on because there's not an, I don't feel like there's enough EV players that are thinking like, how do we work with Tesla or how do we work with the established, you know, EV standards? Apteris doesn't really compete with that much more on the road. It's kind of in its own, doesn't feel right to call it a sedan or a coupe, or it, it, it feels like its own genre. Yes. 
You are right. It's not even a car. It's a blue ocean strategy. And a blue ocean strategy says we have a unique process. We're not bound by the marketplace, you know, expectations. A lot of people want to naturally compare us or put us in some place, but we think that's a, an advantage. If we were trying to, you know, change or apply some of these things in a, in a different market segment, we would be absolutely, you know, first and foremost talking about the competition or the perceived market acceptance. But we don't have that. We're, it's not even a car. I think what's blown my mind is how little emphasis has been put on solar with EVs. I feel like there's not enough push in that way because it takes away even the, I don't even have to plug it in. It'll just charge itself. The only maintenance I could really think of with the Aptera was like tire stuff, but even that's different because you guys got three instead of four. Do you need to rotate the tires like a typical car or? No, that's a good question. I'll stop. I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about something you mentioned in the, in the beginning of that sentence, but the tire rotation, you would normally do that anyway. And that we went through some iterations in the pursuit of, of, of efficiency uh, with different tire sizes, whereby the front tires were different size and diameter and width and everything from the rear. But now we have a common size. Just for what it's worth, we, we have a very efficient way to uh, top off the uh, wiper fluid. Oh, good. It, that, that'll be a little bit of a surprise, but it, it makes the most sense when you kind of frame it in the right way for everybody. Here's what Aptera does. It takes available, low-cost energy from the grid, mm -hmm. right? Generated electricity that you purchase. We efficiently use that in a manner that is three to four, even more times more efficient than any other kind of vehicle to move two people over great distance. We meaningfully supplement that with free energy from the sun. And not just for a small percentage, it's a meaningful percentage. It's not everything but it's a starting point for something. And that is, I mean, really we talk about the sun is our superpower, you know, we have stellar charging and we are able to meaningfully add to our electricity amount by having it exposed to the sun. That's the difference. That's the differentiator versus any other solar application. This is just the beginning. And we can start to apply that on other types of, of transport where it becomes as meaningful as this starting point. Do you think that this is only the beginning for your technology and not just a car, but in general, do you think you can maybe apply the solar panels that you're making that are curved, nothing like anything else on the market towards maybe more complex uh, architectural builds for buildings or anything else that might need that geometric quality to it, or even branching off to just energy storage systems, being able to apply what you've learned with the cells that you're using, or at least the systems that you're using, towards a more stationary system for grabbing energy or storing energy? 100% yes. And it's nice to hear you say that, someone outside of our, let's say, brain trust, but also our partners that recognize that advantage in what we're doing. We are using the Aptera vehicle as a starting point, but the application of all those things that you just mentioned is right there in our mind the entire time. And a lot of people do see that exact thing, and then they, they get excited about it. With the solar part, we're at the edge of the art. That's a term I like to use because you have to push. You can't just take something and say, okay, this works here. You have to say, well, how do we make that improvement so it works better? And then it cycles back to the things you said, stationary applications, mobility solutions, stationary applications. The sun is always on. It might not be always shining on this side of the earth. There's always somewhere that is gathering that energy and that energy released every day is unbelievable. And we're very much chasing nature in the ability to capture that solar energy and use it in a meaningful way to move us. And that, that's, that's the really exciting part about about what Aptera represents as the beginning. So thinking about maybe some other accessories and maybe the more immediate future, I know something that I've been thinking about as a potential owner of an Aptera in the future is charging it at a supercharging station. It seems like Tesla's geared their superchargers more towards their vehicles with having the port on the side where Aptera has it in the back middle. Do you think Aptera would maybe produce some type of accessory that extends that supercharging cable so it's a little bit easier for Aptera owners to plug in. Do you think that's something that more of Tesla or some other third party can probably generate? Aptera and a third party would be able to provide you know, for that situation, but we're kind of back to that. It's in the middle for a reason. Then it's not, you're not dependent on one side. 
you know, we have an entire um, methodology of like, there's a little arrow that tells you which side your, your energy fill nozzle is on, it still is a, is a confounding issue, right? There's some elegance that needs to be incorporated into that experience, but as a starting point in the middle, that's the least of our problems if we have to provide an extension. Oh, okay. Did you, in a lot did, of, did you hear that? Yeah. Yeah, I heard that. Chris Definitely McCammon is Chris. weighing in that it, Chris and Quincy have been to the supercharger with our you know center charge port and it, it, it reaches. It might be too early to talk about, I know, so you don't have to spill all the beans, but I'm curious if your guys' mission or goal is to like not fit into existing car platforms or is your goal to make like the most efficient footprint like you have a two-seater now and it's got a lot of storage space which is great i think i've heard references to that on the site before doing higher passenger vehicles or kind of the antithesis of the aptera right now is all these big inefficient electric pickup trucks and it makes me think like would aptera design the most efficient pickup truck possible or would they say like the form factor is flawed fundamentally. There's a couple of fun ways to answer that. For sure, we know what other vehicles could look like and how to make them reflect exactly not only the ethos of efficiency, composite, solar, but also the visual. What, what would a visual resemblance look like in, you, you can pick up segment, you led with the pickup truck. We know what that looks like and we know that we have to solidly present our three-wheel vehicle, because that's our, that's our first product, and we have to focus on that. The same thing I said about when you close your eyes, you kind of sketch both the truck that you reference and, and our vehicle, the Aptera. We have that same power in that segment of, of a pickup vehicle. We've gone much further in a bunch of different types of vehicles from a kind of a philosophical exercise, not answering the question, but asking, and, and the way we did it as a design project was what if Aptera made or produced or, or looked at this segment, what would that look like? And then once you kind of see which points of the ethos it hits, then you can decide that it's either appropriate or not appropriate. For example, and, and I will tell you we've gone, let's call it downscale, the number of wheels, and we've gone upscale, meaning the number of passengers or cargo and also the number of wheels. So we have a spectrum of vehicles that helps validate not only the ethos, but also gives you that next step to say, yeah, this is how it works on uh, here. This is our awesome starting point. And when we apply it to this segment, this is, the, this is the potential result. You can see I'm a little bit leaning forward and more excited about it. It's awesome, all of it. Definitely. I'm impatient, I guess, but it kind of kills me that you guys are in like, we need the funding to get production started. Cause I'm like, how has such a genius design or how has such a genius outlook not received the, the same investment that I see from these other startups like these. And I wonder if it's because like big investors, when they see it, they go, oh, two seater, that's not enough, big enough market. I, I'm scared it looks too weird. It looks too different. I think it's wise to say we need to focus on our first product because I think that cripples a lot of other startups as they get too distracted with so many different trims and so many different models. Do you think there's a line to be drawn of like, we got to we gotta show potential investors that it's more than just this vehicle or it's more than we want to expand and maybe that convinces more people to invest in the brand or do you think that risks too much distraction? There is a line there and there is a need to show, you know, beyond what, what the starting point is. But let's let's focus for a second on the starting point. By the way, there was like seven questions in there, which was really Sorry. awesome of you. And that's great. <laughs> Sorry. We've got to show that we can efficiently and live up to all of our ethos in this first product. So you have the launch edition, you have kind of some gated things, now able to show how we're able to do it. Now that we know exactly what the what is, which is essentially where pencils down, the design is locked in, we don't need funding for that. That's where a lot of startups, you know, they start with that. We need funding to develop this idea. We're at a different place. The second point is when we talk to investors, and I'm gonna zoom way out here, your efficiency point is the whole, the whole leaning thing. If we go on a bigger scale, mankind has never been more efficient. It feels like we're being really wasteful. But if you, if you go on a grander time scale, we're able to extract resources and use them more efficiently, but not as efficiently as we could or should. And that's the point where like the future is super bright. If you go back a couple of centuries, you know, we were very wasteful with resources. We're so much better at using those resources now, but we have a lot more people that are doing the same thing. 
So we've, we're, we're finding that balance. But a lot of the doomsday scenario never kind of, the calculation doesn't really involve the optimism and the, the unknown, the technological breakthroughs historically and magically keep happening. That's on the grand scale. On the, on the, back to the, the middle zone is beyond this vehicle, here's what Aptera is about. Here's what we can do. And it goes fundamentally to the question before about you know, st solar on static. It's not a car company. It's not a solar EV. It's all of those things. Eventually it'll grow into, like it could grow into an automobile company. But really what it is, it's, it's about using resources in the most efficient way and being able to do that in an appealing way in some market segments and also in other market segments where it's very quiet, let's say unknown, right behind the scenes. And there's a great need for efficiency across the board. I wake up every day and I, I think about the inside and the outside of our vehicle, but I'm more excited about the rest of of everything that we're doing. You've now got me thinking more about what a Aptera motorcycle would look like with two wheels or an Aptera supercar with four wheels and all that. Just like how aero efficient and just powerful that form factor would be. The car that you guys are making right now just seems to be called the Aptera. I haven't really seen anything like specific like, you know, Ford and their Ford F-150 and all that or right. Tesla with the Model 3 or anything like that. Right. Do you think that this vehicle that you guys are making is going to be given a name eventually, or is it just going to be called the Aptera and anything else after that is just going to be the Aptera SUV or the Aptera truck or the Aptera boat? If you go back and replay that question that you just said, you'll find the answer. One of our strengths is our authenticity and uniqueness. And if we stray into trying to put conventional things relative to this product, we're gonna lose some of that authenticity and, and frankly give up power. It was a question that we've asked in many different ways with ourselves and also with some very key advisors. The answer is, does it need a name? You stated it, it's like, does it need a name? And then you kind of justified why it doesn't. And it's, it's, that's why it's so enjoyable to have these conversations because you realize like, oh, I guess that makes a lot of sense. You want that convention defined moment where you kind of go, oh, I get it. I mean, that, that's the emotional part. Um, I, I use this term too, I've, it's, it's a product like Aptera to begin with, but it's either a mirror or a canvas. And a canvas is something you look at and you're like, I imagine myself doing these things with that. Right? You, you paint on it your hopes and dreams and aspirations and also your intelligence. You say, oh, I did the math and this is awesome, right? It's, it's really fun. Or it's a mirror and it might be reflecting something fear-based, like uh, that's different, I, I can't do that. Or that appears to be something I'm not comfortable with. It's one of those products that doesn't need a name. It's a mirror canvas. We removed the nose logo because that space was needed for a better purpose. That was one of those conventional center mounted logos that it was okay at the time, but we realized like it's better without it. I agree. There you go. You don't need branding to know what it is. And that's like the epitome of Aptera is like it, does, it is its own logo. You see Correct. the logo by seeing the car. Like I don't know what you see in your personal life when people look at it, but I'm sure it's a lot more personal when you're the designer. But most people, when I show it to them, their first reaction is that must be really dangerous because it's weird looking. I try to show them all the emphasis on the, the, the curvature of it and that there's still crumple zones and stuff. But I don't know what your personal life looks like when you show it off to people like what what is what is their first question it is a very different experience you will soon have it where you see it in person versus analyzing photos or videos or everything you've seen the question that i normally ask someone who comes in and they see it for the first time is and i watch their face it's usually the answer where they're like oh yeah this is way different than i thought right so it's 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 either bigger or you know, maybe wider, maybe smaller, but it, it's, it's not, the reality doesn't match the perception, and that's the fun part. Um, there's also another phenomenon that we've observed where, again, someone like yourself, you've done all the math, you've, you've read everything you can, and you're prepared with all these questions. You need to know these answers. And then you see the vehicle, and you get in the vehicle, you drive the vehicle, and all of that goes away. You're like, I, I don't care about anything that I thought about, but the, the, you just have this experience. Right? That's why we have over 41,000 interested people that say, I want that. There's something, and they need answers. They want answers to all those questions. When you encounter it in, in real life, it's very different. And 
As far as me being the designer and, and how, you know, my personal experience, it, it is very clear based on what Steve and Chris laid out, right? So it's, so it's not my design. It's not even their design. It's an understanding that we're gonna remain true to this formula, the math, and see where we can maximize the user experience, but also capture the emotional and the just the appeal of it. And I think we've done a really good job on that, but we're subservient again to like what the math established. So everything we're doing is a little bit around the edges. I'm in a privileged position because I can use the team I can work with the engineers. We can collaborate on all these all these things. The product is bigger than any any one of us, and that's why I don't need to stand next to the vehicle. It just no, you and you enjoy the vehicle. It's not about me. It's about you, and that's that's where we are with our accelerator program. They believe in the, the company. That's where we are with 41,000 you know reservation interested parties. That's where we are with all the hundreds of thousands of questions that that everybody has. We're now beginning to tell much more of the story of the how and the why as we work towards our, our next gates. And we can't share everything, but we're happy to share the things that, that you know as direct supporters are important. That makes, that makes a, lot of, uh, a, lot, a lot of what we do so important is, is sharing to our investors and to our interested parties how we got here and why. Yeah, it almost feels like Mother Nature's design. This is just yes. aerodynamics and the sun just telling yes. you, here's how to make, this is what makes the most sense. We are chasing nature in its efficiency. Well said. But what's the day-to-day -day operations look like now? Like, is it fine-tuning the assembly line or, you know, as, as chief of design, what, what's your day-to-day -day look like at this stage? Okay, yeah, the first part is, um, you know, the, the adjustment and everything of the production. And you've seen the, the videos where we talk about how the system, so now that system is being refined to the actual product, which is the, you know, we're using the term launch edition, but it's not gonna be called the launch edition. It'll, you know, we'll, we'll say those words, but they won't be branded as the launch edition, let's say. My day-to-day -day is is much more following through on all the the details, especially on the interior, in order for those, those programs to be kicked off with the suppliers so that they have all the information, and know all the specifications. We're also currently, you know, we have a framework that was established about two years ago. You need a user's manual as a, as a consumer product. So we're, we work on that and that, that relates to UI UX. We have that app, so we're working on the app so we, we, can, we can deliver not just the vehicle, but the whole downstream. And then there's part of it is the investment part where I get to present the company and the process and the future that makes us more investable beyond the appeal of, I want one of those vehicles. I'm excited for the software stuff too, because I feel like that's a huge piece, especially with such a display focused interaction that getting that software in the app yeah. fine tuned is a huge portion of experience. Yeah. So I'm excited for more coverage of that. That's the beauty of software is that, you know, you can, you can test it and then you can update it continually. That's one of the secret things about certain products that are available now that the thing gets better with time and we will have that same experience. It will it will improve with time. Is it too crazy for me to make a suggestion? No. Because the one idea I had is like, I live in a sunny climate, which is why I'm very interested in the Aptera. Pretty sure there's a common scenario. There's, there's sunny parts of my yard, but then as the day goes on, it gets more shady. So my thought process was, if there was a way from the app to just kind of tell Aptera move up a little bit, just so it's more in the sunlight. Like, I don't know if it needs to be vision based or anything, but if you could just tell it like, all right, that's a shady portion of the yard now, move over a bit, get more sun here. I would love that. <laughs> I think that'd be really neat. Absolutely. Why not? There's, yeah. there's, no, there's, no, there's no real barrier to that. Especially like that's the power of imagination. Imagine a thousand miles. Imagine, you know, uh, light off-roading. Imagine camping with the Aptera. Imagine it, you know, basically self moving around the, the best to, to optimize charging. You imagine all those things, that's what we are, that's the business we're in. We're in the inevitable future business. That's awesome. So it's cool. definitely a very exciting future and we can't wait to see when it comes to fruition. We definitely hope that this acceleration initiative that you guys are doing to raise funds reaches its climax soon, just so that way it kicks off that 12 month production plan that you guys have right now in order to deliver these cars to customers and finally see not just data wise, but also just from pictures online or anything else, how people are living with this car and what they're subjecting it to and all the different cases that 
they might run into that may spur a lot of these cool ideas kind of like what drew brought up with what if it inches further ahead so that way it stays out of the shade yeah. ideas like that is what i'm really excited about for the future not just when the vehicle comes out but all the use cases that we'll see yeah yeah it's super exciting time and you know you mentioned the accelerator program we have a couple things coming out uh, soon that it's not just the first 2000 it's beyond that and we have some very special ways to both serialize it right this is number one of 2000 but also to differentiate it and not in such a manner where you know we want to avoid any cliches let's say but also special ways that are like huh that's the right way to do it because it fits with the, with their whole um, ethos of the of the company. Such a freedom endorsing vehicle to get free energy because I, I noticed that most of the time when me and my wife are driving into a parking lot, we look for a shady spot, and I keep thinking about how when we have the Aptera, it'd be the opposite. Well, don't don't park there. There's shade. You know, <laughs> park over here. It's more sunny. Right. There's the solar part that is very, um, very meaningful to this specific product. And that's, um, that's something that we can really be proud of as a differentiator. Hopefully we can catch you again, Jason. This has been very fun. Yeah, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to discuss maybe when, you know, my full voice is there, but there's so much wonderful, um, both backstory, but also forward looking optimism relative to what this company uh, is able to do on this product and its experience and beyond. And I'm happy to always talk about that. Hope you guys uh, can get all the investment you need as soon as possible. You definitely deserve it more than anyone, in my opinion. Thank you. We, we appreciate all your support and all your leverage, being able to share our story. It's very helpful. I'm sure some people have, have made commitments based on what they've heard you say. Oh, I hope so. Yeah, that'd be that'd be a, a hopeful thought. We really appreciate <laughs> love that. it. So catch you guys for more interviews on Aptera later. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. So hopefully that kind of got you guys excited as we are for the future of more efficiency focused vehicles and self-powered vehicles. And I personally want to thank everybody that's been investing in Aptera, helping them accelerate their very clear and noble mission statement. And also thank you to everybody supporting this channel directly. Seriously, helps us out a ton, as does just watching these videos. So thanks again. Have an excellent rest of your day.